Hello, Fear Seekers, and welcome back to the channel. Today, we're going to be diving into some disturbing, allegedly true, winter horror stories. If you enjoy the content and want to help the channel grow, consider leaving a like and subscribing to keep up with future videos. Now without further ado, sit back, bundle up against the cold, and get ready to ferment your fears. I'm a 25-year-old female. I've been a caregiver for six years now. I've worked in a few different places, retrained and reintroduced to new residents. The first CBRF I ever worked for was a 13-bed facility. A CBRF takes in more than just geriatrics who can no longer live alone. It handles anyone from addicts to dementia to old age. In order to become a DSP, you have to go through about four weeks of training. Direct support professionals go through basic first aid, administering medications, basic fire safety, and dementia support classes. All the training classes never quite prepare you for being on the floor. During dementia training, they taught us about dementia with Lewy bodies. It's a degenerative disease that causes auditory and visual hallucinations. We ran through different scenarios of how to redirect a resident while they are having these episodes. One example was of the residents chasing after their past loved ones. Often they wander away from the home and end up lost. We had to stay vigilant in order to keep them safe. The main thing was we were to never discredit them or their hallucinations. We were taught to play along and redirect. Telling them, no, it's made up, or no one is there, can cause them to fly into a violent rage or break down into inconsolable tears. When I first started on the floor, I met one of the first dementia patients right away. Her name was Beverly. My first interaction with her was her coming up behind me and whispering to me, You better take care of them, or I'll have to kill you. She then pointed at the floor as if someone was standing there. I nervously laughed and ran to my administrator's office. She explained to me that Beverly was harmless, but she often saw children. She reminded me of my training and to play along, but then added, You may see them too. I continued working there for a few more months without much of any incident. I worked the second shift, so there were many uncomfortable nights. While vacuuming the hallways, I heard the door alarm go off. Every time someone opened one of the main doors to outside, an alarm would ring. I looked out the window to see Beverly, in nothing but a nightgown, in the middle of a Wisconsin winter. She was bent over at the waist, walking slowly, as if a small child was holding her hand and leading her down the parking lot. I quickly ran outside to catch up with her and tried to consult her. She was confused when she saw me and asked where the little girl went. I explained to her that her mom came to pick her up and quickly brought her back inside. A few weeks later, some of the other staff were talking between shift change, and I overheard them talking about Beverly's little girl. Turned out I wasn't the only one that had seen Beverly have an episode. But then they went on to talk about the daycare next door. I hadn't been working there for long, so one of the veteran DSPs went on to explain about the original daycare that used to be in the new one's place. I guess it burned down and some of the kids got hurt. The veteran DSP wondered if there was any correlation between what Beverly was seeing and the old daycare. The rest of the group of the DSPs went on to talk about weird sightings they had seen in our building always catching glimpses of someone short out of the corner of their eye, things going missing or even being misplaced. We had even had a resident wake up screaming in the middle of the night saying he saw a woman on his ceiling staring at him. 
When I started my shift that night, I was left with the veteran DSP. All the other DSPs had left for the night. I stayed in the kitchen cleaning up after day shift while the vet was passing meds. I heard the back door open and ran to the windows in the back hallway to look. It was Beverly. It was snowing really hard that night so it was hard to see out, but she was in her bent over stance being led away by something again. This time, I saw another person with her, actually holding on to her hand. A little girl with blonde hair. I yelled for the vet and we both ran outside to look for Beverly. We looked all around the building and found nothing. The vet asked if I was sure of what I saw. I swore that I had seen Beverly. I even heard the door alarm go off again. The vet suggested we go back inside and check if maybe she got back in without us noticing. When we got to her room, we both had the air escape us. We found Beverly on the floor, dead. I won't go into too much detail of how she looked, but it still haunts me to this day. She was holding a photo. It was a picture of her daughter when she was little. And her daughter had long blonde hair. This happened about a decade ago, and it still scares me. My great aunt lived alone in a small, two-floor cape house one town over that my grandfather had built her in the 1940s. She had a tiny spare bedroom and writing office upstairs. My great aunt was a nun and teacher, and would often write friends, former students, and work on a book of her stories she had never quite finished. My mother and I would visit from time to time to help take care of chores in and around the house as years went on. When I left for college, my mother started visiting more often. No sense in us both being alone, she told me. While I was away, my great aunt started showing signs of dementia that progressed steadily. It started with stories she'd tell us for the thousandth time, so we already knew them well. One story would start when she and my grandfather were kids, but then resolve somehow when she was an adult. Basically, she combined two unrelated stories into one, which would leave her confused. She also started forgetting to eat, take her meds, and would crank the heat in summer to the point where she'd be dehydrated. Some days were worse than others, so when I finished college, we started visiting nearly daily as she absolutely refused going into an assisted living home. We set up Meals on Wheels and asked some of her friends and former neighbors to come by so we weren't the only ones visiting. My mother and I convinced her to start writing in the kitchen, rather than upstairs, to prevent a fall on the steps. Without a reason to go upstairs, we shut off the old second floor heaters and closed the overpainted, squeaky door to the stairs. We'd find the door cracked open every so often, but my great aunt insisted she didn't go up anymore. We weren't the only ones stopping by, so maybe someone fetched something upstairs and forgot to close it. Again, my great aunt was a nun, and around the holidays, she'd roll out the more religious stories and talk about God a lot. One day, when I was visiting her alone, she started reflecting on her life, mortality, and when the man upstairs was going to come for her. I changed the subject as it's uncomfortable. But over time, she started talking more about when she'd die. He's going to come for me soon. I don't know when the man upstairs will do it, though. Trying to reassure her, I said, Auntie, I'm sure you have many years left. God isn't coming to take you anytime soon. With the most serious expression I've ever seen on her sweet old face, she said, No, not God. The man upstairs. At around this point in time, she started seeing things, like flashes or spiders that weren't there and a little boy in her living room that only she could see, even when my mom or I were visiting. So I chalked this up to the dementia as well. Later that week, snow fell, 
so after shoveling myself out early, I went to my great aunt's to shovel her walkway from my mom, who would be visiting later. After shoveling, I called my aunt from my warm car so she'd know it was taken care of. I also said I wasn't coming in as I had to go to work, and she thanked me. I drove off and noticed I had forgotten my rock salt I had used on the walkway, so quickly circled the block and picked it up. As I was reaching for it, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. The second floor light in the old writing office had turned on. I glanced quickly, then pretended I didn't see it. I got in my car and went down the road a short way, confirming in my mirrors it was on. I called my mom. Can you call auntie and see if she has company over? Don't say I asked, and let me know how long it takes her to pick up. My mom called back almost immediately. No, she doesn't have company over. Not this early. And she picked up right away. Mom, you need to call the police. The light upstairs turned on after I talked to her. There's no way a 95-year-old lady hung up, hustled upstairs, then back down to pick up your call. There was no phone hooked up on the second floor. As my mom called the police, I called my aunt. Hi, Auntie. I almost forgot. You have a doctor's appointment today. I'll come pick you up. We can grab a hot chocolate before we head over. I parked my car in front of the house and acted as normally as I could. It felt like an eternity helping her get her house coat on and out the door. As I turned the lock, I heard footsteps above us in the second floor room where I saw the light turn on. I helped her into my car never looking at the house, too scared for what I'd see in the window. We went down the road a bit, and I called my mom. She was already on her way over, and said the police would be by shortly. I told her where I parked. She arrived there, and the police weren't far behind her. I flagged down the cop before he got closer and told him what I saw and heard. He radioed for two more cars. My mom stayed with our great aunt to keep her calm as police surrounded her house. I gave them the keys to the doors and two went in as the third cop and I stayed outside. After a few tense minutes, the two officers returned with a disheveled, gaunt man in handcuffs. Oh, the man upstairs, my aunt said to my mother, on looking as they fought the crazed man into the back of one of the cruisers. My great-aunt had apparently let the disturbed homeless man in, thinking he was Meals on Wheels, and he had been secretly living upstairs as my great-aunt was confused if he was even real. When we were allowed back in, we saw that the upstairs was a mess. Garbage, rotting food stolen from the kitchen. The amount of filth was scary. The creepiest thing were the notes. Written many, maybe hundreds of times, in different inks and pencil scrawlings around the writing office window that overlooked her walkway was, Go away. Don't stay. I'll come down. The back of the door to the stairs had notes too. She can see me, but you don't. And I can see you. It was clear he had probably wrote notes each time someone visited over weeks and possibly months. My great-aunt was temporarily shocked, but it was quickly forgotten given her condition, and would ask about the man upstairs less and less. The homeless man, who was in poor physical and mental health himself, was hospitalized and passed after a few weeks later into the winter. He had escaped the hospital, but his body was found the day after. He died having succumbed to the cold and exposure. My mom and I told Auntie a couple weeks later when we found out. Oh, I know. He told me last night. He's upstairs again, but you can't see him now. At just that instant, my mom and I heard the door to the stairs squeak open. Hey, 
I want to start my first post off with a little bit about me, as it helps in context with the story. I'm a 22-year-old person, working in the medical field. I'm a floater medical technician at the moment, which means I get a schedule every week going to different assisted living facilities, skilled nursing facilities, independent living facilities, all the living facilities that usually hold the majority of elderly people, and help with vaccinations and general patient care involving meds all around my state. Sometimes I'm only 30 minutes from home, but I've driven three hours before, and most times, they drag on long into the night. Being that I'm not really that picky, and I know how to handle myself, and money is money, I usually don't mind the drive. My parents would drive four hours to a location for a day trip, and that same day we would drive back. Nothing too crazy though. It can get a little tiring after working six days in a row. Now that you know how I work, I guess I'll tell you about where I live. No names, but I'm basically in the foothills, or in mountains. Lots of back roads, lots of trees. I know. Typical of scary stories, the middle of nowhere with spooky trees. But once again, I don't think much of it. I've lived around forests all my life. I see them as peaceful rather than scary. So I finish up this particular clinic at around 6pm, and as you know if you live up north in the winter, it's dark by then. But once again, I'm thinking nothing of it. But even so, I'm tired and hungry and ready to go to bed. My team calls it a day, and I set up to take my hour and 45 minute drive home. The first 30 minutes, I'm in town, then on a highway. So pretty nice, smooth sailing, listening to lo-fi music as per usual, using it as my decompress and meditative time. I keep driving, then I notice a huge crash up ahead, like a four or five car pile up. Real nasty on this busy highway. So I take an exit off the highway, going to drive around it so I can get home and into my bed quicker, rather than sit and wait for them to clear a path from one of the lanes. Anyway, I start driving through this town that honestly looks like maybe three frickin' people live in it. All the buildings are run down, the road is so messed up, it's awful. My car's poor tires and hydraulic system were begging for me to stop, so I had to slow down a lot as to not stress my car. It's dark and really old, but again, places like this exist. A town on its last breath. I've seen them more than a few times from living up and down the east coast in less than crappy neighborhoods. I'm not going to judge. But I will note this place is just really, really empty. No cars, no lights, boarded up houses, just empty. I'm driving between 15 and 20 miles an hour, my brights on so I can see. It's a clear night, so I have that going for me. As I'm driving past this big fire department overrun with bear trees, a loud thunk comes from the roof of my car. Great. I quickly pull over into the parking lot of the abandoned fire department. Wonderful, I'm thinking. Get sideswiped by a random dude at a rest stop and dent the top of my poor orange berry in one week. I open the door in a panic, expecting to see some tree branch denting my roof. But nope. Nothing. Which is weird enough as is, so I'm like, what the hell? I knew something hit my roof. So I go to check behind my car. Maybe it rolled off. Maybe it was a bird or a bat that fell then flew away. There are a lot of trees around. I walk all around my car, looking into the messed up road. Nothing. I chalk it up to the winged animal idea and climb back in my car a little rattled, so it's silent as I get resituated. That's when I heard this ear-piercing shriek. I'm talking, someone is screaming so loud it sounded like their vocal cords could break. I lock my door and start getting back on the road. Calm down, I'm thinking. Bobcats are everywhere. You've heard what they sound like plenty, like a woman crying bloody murder. 
It's just a bobcat. My hands are shaking, and I'm trying to drive out of there as fast as I can. Just a bobcat. Some kids playing a prank. Some homeless tweaker. My car was rattling back and forth as I got up to a comfortable 35 miles an hour. Of course, that's me, pushing it for my abused car. I'd make it up to him later with a nice wash. I drive another mile through this town, and I'm a few miles from the exit to the highway again. I'm mentally kicking myself for being so scared. Like a little pansy, I'm freaking out over some animals. I'm a mile away now thanks to the helpful yet very beat up and weathered signs. I'm calming down. Nothing crazy. Maybe it would be a good idea to play my lo-fi again, as I paused that 24-7 livestream one from YouTube when I got out of my car. Just as I reach for my phone in the passenger side seat, something rushes past my headlights. I scream and break hard. I don't know why. It was yards away from me in the very distant part of my headlights. Alright, that's the final straw. I'm crying at this point, shaking so hard I can barely grip the wheel, eyes blurry with tears. I don't care about the music anymore, and even though I'm still reminding myself that animals inhabit tree-dense abandoned towns all the time, this situation was still enough to get me crying. I keep driving, trying to focus on getting to that damn highway. But that's when I see... it? If it's a human, then... It's not like any human I've ever seen. On the side of the road, seeming to stand so politely on the sidewalk, as if waiting for me to pass it so it could cross the street, was this tall... thing. It had sunken facial features and looked naked. Loose skin, a lot of it. Sagging down its legs and arms, piling at the wrists, ankles and knees, around its neck and hanging from its jaw. I saw it for half a second before I slammed my foot down on the gas. Sorry, Orangebury. Like I said, I'd make it up to you. I'm screaming obscenities now. F this, F that, what the F? You get the idea. My onslaught of emotions being too much. Goosebumps covered me from head to toe. Tears rolling down my face. Hands gripping my steering wheel so tight that there were nail marks in it. I swerve onto the highway and recklessly into the other lane. I drive at 80 for a little bit before eventually slowing down and pulling over to the side of the road to sob and call my dad. He picks up instantly, and when he hears my crying, he's all concerned, trying to get my story. I explain everything. I called it a man in some scary monster costume. My dad instructed me to call the police, which I didn't really want to do. I was already a nervous wreck. Having to explain it or even go back with someone? Absolutely F that. But my dad insisted, so I called the cops. I tell them that I had seen a man in the town back there off the exit, in a costume, and that he had scared me really badly. After a few more questions, the cops said they'd check it out and sent me on my way. No, I can't be sure it wasn't a costume. No, I can't be sure it wasn't some weird outfit and bad lighting at night. No, I'm not saying all of these events were connected in some way. But what I am saying is, it all happened so quick. It was hard to dismiss as nothing. And if this was a costume, it had to be a damn good costume because it was hyper-realistic. And I saw every single fold and wrinkle and could even make out a couple blue veins. I don't even remember the name of the town. I haven't gotten a call back from the police about any updates. It happened about a month ago and I'm better now. As long as I'm in my car, I'm safe. But I no longer feel safe being outside of my car at night. Not even the short walk from my front door to my driveway is safe anymore. I'll start shaking and panting if I'm outside in the dark alone for more than five seconds. I don't know who to tell or what to believe, but, at the very least, 
I hope you guys found it entertaining. Thank you for your time. Hey guys, glad to see you made it to the end of the video. Have you ever had any close encounters in the dead of winter? Make sure to let me know in the comments below. If you have any requests for future videos, be sure to let me know and I'll do my best to work them into future content. Alright guys, that just about wraps up the video. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. So long, fear seekers. I'll see you in the next video.